just want to say a couple of things. Uh, there is some deliberately obnoxious stuff in there. Please take it in the spirit in which it's intended. Uh, there's a strong opinion to weekly help. Uh, also, if you don't understand anything at any point, please interrupt or heckle. I don't mind. Heckle anyway, it makes me feel good. Boo. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, the title of my talk is Negative Space, or Why Dynamic Languages Are Bad at Functions. So you're probably a little familiar with this uh, image, the, the way different uh, languages are seen by different fans. And I've talked to a couple of people tonight about things like Ramda and uh, you know, functional programming libraries in untyped languages. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes trying to convince you that it may be a good idea, but it's not, you're not getting the full story, you're not getting the full benefit. Everyone saw with a picture? Trying to place themselves? All right. So, this is you know, well known Chomsky hierarchy of languages. You've got your regular expressions, context free, context sensitive, recursively enumerable. You know, you know those other ones, but this will do. Um, and we usually think about in this term of, of power. Power is a good thing, right? You know, computational freedom is a power up. It's like you know, you're buzzing along with a little video game and you get the, the thing. So, regular is boring, can only do a couple of things. Context free, I right? know it's a little bit interesting, you can balance parentheses. Um, context sensitive, oh, you can think about two things, at, more than two things at once. You can you know, recognize a language which is N A's, N B's, and N C's. Can't do that in any of the others. Uh, and finally, everybody's favorite, the Turing machine. Recursively enumerable languages, any damn thing you want. You cannot get any higher than that, as far as we know. Some of them say quantum computing or whatever, but that's just doing it faster. So, there's another way to look at it though, which is to go down the hierarchy. Freedom of slavery. Uh, you run any kind of Turing complete system, it might run forever. You can't get away from it. You can prove an individual Turing complete language program uh, halting. But you can't do it in general. And this pops up all over the place. I was at a talk at LabCon last week talking about how you can get accidentally Turing complete configuration languages. You really, really don't want that. You know, especially that when that data starts coming from the outside. Um, if we restrict it to context sensitive languages, well, this is great. It might not run a long time, but it will always complete, and we can put a bound on the amount of memory that we're going to use. Context free. Even better. Worst case, n to the three times the size of the grammar. And regular languages, you know, you can just do it linearly. It's great. You know, linear in the size of the input. Um, so this is sort of this idea of negative space. All right. The idea that you gain control by removing things that can't be done. Uh, oh, yeah. So we've got this interesting thing in art as well, right? There's sort of there's negative space in this uh, in this sculpture uh, that suggests a lot more. It's, it's more effective leaving that negative space in. Same thing with the Henry Moore sculpture at the beginning. And in computing, it's exactly the same. Things that are impossible make your system better because you can start limiting the state space and think about what your whole system might actually do. Any questions? Seriously, just jump in if anything's unclear. Alright, um, that's more or less what I just said, isn't it? You know, it's, you always talk about what you can do in a programming language and adding new things in. It's really hard to find languages that say there's definitely nothing sketchy happening here. So, can you go back to the space? Right, uh, what? Sorry, what? Sorry, want to go back to this one? Yes. So, the omission, like you said, the omission. Yes. The, the fact that, well, in art, that the emission of things makes a more powerful artwork in computing, that uh, the emission of ability to do certain things makes it easier to guarantee what your program will do. So, you're, by negative space, do you mean um, type systems where you will reduce the number of possible programs in order to reduce it down to the Good programs, opposed to all the ones yes. that are bad. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Let's play a game. 
giving you this function. Um, funny mouse looking symbol of one gives you two. Funny mouse looking symbol of two gives you four. What's that? Uh, mouse set symbol of three. Six. Six. Eight. 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 Um, and that's even restricting it to integers. You're implicitly assuming I'm restricting to integers, but yeah, that, that, I'm assuming it. <laughs> I'm going to that website for the encyclopedia of integer sequences. <laughs> well, that's one thing, but I mean, the point I guess I'm trying to make is that even if we're restricting it to 64 bit integers, it's just too damn big. You know, 2 to 64 inputs, mapping to 264 outputs, that's 2 to 128 possible functions. Uh, even if, you, if you've got a given function and you want some property to hold on it and you want it to hold over the whole range, um, you're still going to have to look at 260, 2 to 64 outputs and test a million a second, you'll still be there for half a million years. So we're going to try something making it a little bit smaller. This is, what, this is one approach. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, these things are sum types. They're a bit like uh, enums. In, uh, in C, uh, and actually you could model this in C, uh, except that they can actually carry extra values. So I can set up uh, a list using sums. So what I've got here is kind of a strategy. A strategy is something which takes a traffic light to an action. So traffic light's red, yellow, or green, and the actions are break and continue. So how many inhabitants of the traffic light uh, type do we have? Yeah. How many inhabitants of the action data type? Two. So how many strategies are there? Six. So we get to choose one action for every possible option. So we're going to check three times, and you've got two options at each. So that's two to the power of three, so two to the eight. And so we, we can actually start counting, you know, how many possible implementations there are. And if you've got eight implementations, you could just generate them all and test them all. It does what you want. You know, it, it's small enough that it's kind of, uh, it's trackable. So that was an attempt at making it smaller, making the set smaller. You can go the other way. You can make it bigger. I give you a function, so this is uh, Haskell type syntax, which says that there's a function foo, which takes an A and gives you back an A. How many implementations can we can we think of for this one? <laughs> you put your hand down, Felipe. Yeah. Any suggestions? Yeah. Just one. Just one? Yeah. Um, you, there's no way you can pull an A out of thin air. There's one slightly cheesy answer, which is that we're running in a Turing complete language, so I can just loop forever and you know not ever actually hand anything back, and that can go any type you like. We don't talk about that. That's very old now. What, what about R? Wow. That's a, a, a function that takes an A and gives you back a list of A's. Jason? Really? I, I can think of two off the top of my head. Oh, that's true. Okay. You do. <laughs> 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 well, are, are you thinking of well, the list of the you, you, can, you can repeat them, obviously. But the thing, thing to notice here, you know, that this is kind of isomorphic to the integers, effectively, because it's the only thing you get from this is you can have a list of elements of that thing with zero to infinity kind of things. But it's an integral infinity, so, you know, we're happy. What do you, what do you mean by implementation? Um, well, the, uh, an implementation that fits the type. Like like the point out the function for this type, how many functions could you consider? Yeah, exactly. Um, so what this means is I call bar on you know one and I get one comma one comma one. I now know exactly what it's going to do if I pass two to it. There is no way it could have done anything differently. Well, it because it can't reach into the A. So you say we're making it bigger, it applies for more things, but I know more things about it now. Uh, if it was, you know, int to list events, could literally do anything. You know, we saw that before. Yeah. But 
But aren't there multiple functions that you can implement that are of the type particular A and A, like in Uh No, only one. Because couldn't you have a constant function that returns some integer, and then you can just do every single integer? No, and that's really important. I'm glad you asked that. Um, foo has to work on every A that gets passed in. So it's not allowed to look into the A. Uh, it's not allowed to have any context. It's not allowed to have photo frame. Uh, all it can do is say, well, I've got an A. I'll give you back the A I've got. But it can. OK, so you can't have some eternal constant. No, because you don't have any constant that has type A, except, well, you know, there's a hack in Haskell that you've got undefined, which is just an implementation. Um, right. Yeah, don't worry about it. But the point of this thing is that you can't inspect A. There's no reflection. There's nothing in there. There's no structure. So this is why when you make it bigger, it actually makes it easier because you know all of the things it can't do. Negative space. But is that the same as saying, like, 2A, who is doing 2 times A? Sorry, say again. I'm not, I'm not capturing the essence of what you're saying, right? So I can think of implementing many functions that will take in a type A and return another type A. Can okay. um, you? Depending on the type of A, right? Exactly. You don't get to look at the type. You get a function, you get one argument A, and you can do something with it, but no type specific things. I, you, if it was int to int, you could think of, well, we just looked at int to int, right? That two the 64 different implementations. This, you've got no context, so you have to work within the constraints. This is the whole point of parametricity. You write your functions at this high level, it's not just to be a dick about, look how abstract I am. It reduces the number of possible implementations and the number of possible bugs. Does that make sense? It does, but yeah. Let's talk about it. I have a question. When you say this is the thing, it's being inside the square brackets. Yeah. What's the meaning of that? You're saying in this that has one argument, A? Um, no, no. Uh, sorry, we don't have a white It's, it's syntax, syntactic sugar for a list. Uh, and uh, bracket A is the type of a list. So a list, you know, singly linked list, the same way you do it in any language. Uh, and yeah. Can be as long as you want. Mm -hmm. a, a list of arbitrary length that contains only items of type A. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a list of items of type A. Yes, yes. That's okay. Okay. Yes. Please do interrupt. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say maybe it's important for people who don't grasp it to emphasize that A is a type. If this is a type. Yes. Yeah. Actually, that's a good point. Sorry. Uh -huh. um, sure. So. <laughs> this is um, well, if you see in 64, I this applies to things outside Haskell as well. I'm using Haskell syntax. Forgive me. The capital means that it's a concrete type. Uh, the lowercase here means that it's a type variable. You know, so any any type has to be able to solve it. Yeah. Okay, so just to clarify, can you try to understand? So the Could first you speak one, up a little bit? Oh, sorry. Just to clarify, make sure I understand. So the first function, the only possible implementation is just that the function is A, right? So yeah, if you're going to write it, it, it just returns its argument. Yes, it returns itself. And the second one, there are, you can have as many A's as you want, but there's a countable the infinite amount. Yes. But at least it's uncountable. Right, so exactly. The, so that's why it's good. And I mean, the reason I put that one up is, is mostly to show that, so with the, uh, this one, I, I could go and do this for like a million elements and I still wouldn't know what the next one is. I do, I do this for one element um, and I already know its behavior on everything. That's parametricity. Maybe, um, maybe it's important to point out that foo is not an identity function, it's merely a function that takes a type A and returns well, to, to be fair, I haven't actually written any function here. It's just a type stick for a function. Yeah, right. it's um, a but yeah, I mean, the only actual implementation is ID. Yeah. So, let's turn statement. So, so here, because I'm naive here, right? So, in an implementation of foo, that might take traffic light from your earlier yeah. example, right? So, so F is <coughs> traffic light to traffic light. Right. Why couldn't you roll to the next traffic light? In the, you absolutely could. But then you wouldn't be implementing something with a type of A to A anymore. This is why if you've got the choice to write something, if you can write it with the, the higher level, more abstract types, 
You should, because there are fewer implementations. If you write everything at the level at which you actually use it, you will create space for more bugs. So that function would only work with traffic lights, which means it doesn't follow this signature, because this signature says it has to work with all types. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, if I understand this right, the idea behind this is that because you don't have any information about it, you don't know what operations you can perform on, you just have enough information to say, oh, I can add something to this, or I can subtract, or I can enumerate these things. So you have no options. Like, it's really just, exactly. you have to return it because there are no operations that you know, based on the signature, that I can perform these operations on. And yeah, that's exactly. the idea, right? Okay, okay. So uh, it gets a little bit more complicated in Haskell, at least, because there are type classes. So I could say something like, uh, if I passed in a constraint of read A, that would mean I can make A's out of strings. So then I can start doing all kinds of weird shit, because I can make strings whenever I want to. Right, so the idea being that if we substitute like in, in 64 in your example, that is different because now we know what operations we can perform in We have information based on the fact that you've said that this is an in 64 and we have operations that we know that we can implement this stuff. But in this case, A, we don't have but, hang on. Yeah, that's exactly right. Anyone? I don't actually like slow cell movies, but it's such an arresting image. Alright, so I think that's a five. I, I can't remember. My, my credit letters are, are sketchier than they should be for a Haskell programmer. Um, so I call five one, and I get back two. And I call it again, and I get back two. What happens the third time? What language? Banana. Three. <laughs> <laughs> Banana. Okay, good question. Because if it's, if it's, like, that, if it's another language, that could be a random number generator, and you're, you know. I, I'm just thinking, you, wow. Well, if it's, <laughs> if it's, no, I, you if got it's this right. or if you're a man, <laughs> then you know it's going to Well, let, let's just go to the next slide, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> And the thing is, most languages you use, this is always a possibility. All right, uh, if you're doing functional programming in Python or Ruby or Clojure, there may be a default, a, a convention that, you know, oh, it's considered a bit rude to go and mutate state. But you can't know that. You've got no global proof that something sketchy isn't happening. And this, this caught me recently. Uh, if you create, uh, if there's a parsing library in, in Python where if you create a date, from a string, and there isn't enough information in the string, it doesn't throw an error, it doesn't return null, it fills in today's date for the bits it doesn't have. This was a very confusing one. <laughs> so like, just the business part. Yeah, exactly, you know, 25th of October, and it's like, oh, okay, I'll put in, you know, right now. What else do and the problem is, he put his finger on it exactly here, but this isn't actually a function. All right, if it was a function, you know, you call it once, you know what it's going to do for that input, and you know it doesn't do anything. You know, uh, it's just computing a value. Uh, and this is the, I guess, point I'm trying to make is that Haskell lets you have procedures, and it also lets you have functions, in, in a sense, you know. Um, and most languages don't let you draw that distinction. So, back in the real world, obviously we do usually want to do things. Um, I don't want to get too deep into this, because the answer, of course, is the I am <laughs> um, But I don't want to talk about monads right now, because you haven't, unless you know functor and applicative, it doesn't make any sense. You can think about it more or less as a tag. It's an infectious tag. Um, you can't get an IOA, so you can't get an A out of an IOA except by running it in an IO interpreter. So once, if you've got a function, you know, string to uh, integer, you know that it doesn't go off and do anything sketchy. You know, it's not reading the betting reports, uh, it's not kind of burning your house down, it's just nothing weird is happening. So, yeah, that thing. Mum's house is safe. Um, so the way this actually tends to work in Haskell um, and other sort of strongly type languages is that you push all of the I.O. stuff to the outside and try to make it as dumb and obvious as possible and have everything done as pure functions inside. And if you're interested in them, 
Uh, the Xmonad paper is an excellent resource for how to do this for what seems like a really grungy domain. You know, actually interacting with X11 programs, uh, the X11 server and client, and you know you really can push that shell out to be very thin. Um, so I'm pretty much done. Uh, this is just a little bonus round. Uh, something that uh, Ross Patterson on the functional programming Slack uh, pointed out to me. Uh, there's a bug in both of these these functions. If the idea of Thingo is that if it's true. Uh, you can see that we can sort of. You can see that we, uh, if it's true, um, we want to apply A to C to this one. If it's false, we want to apply this function to, well, as you can see, it's actually applying it accidentally to A. And this one will actually say, no way. You have to explain uh, our last thing to show by A to C. Just a little bit. Oh, um, yeah, okay, so. That's a good yeah. point. I should have rewritten this as a case statement. So this, is, this is pattern matching, and it's just saying if the first thing, if, if it matches this, if the, if the first argument's true, do this thing. If the first, first argument's false, do this thing. And space is being function calling in Haskell. Sorry? Uh, Spaces are function calling in Haskell. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Man, uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. So this is calling, imagine putting a bracket there and commas between each of those. Sorry, I've been doing Haskell so long I forget. Um, so the point here is, this one's a more concrete thing. And it's similar to the argument we showed before, you expect the more concrete things to sort of have more type failures because it's oh, being really specific about the thing they want. It happens here that we're passing in and it's a string in both cases, so it's not going to notice if you, mess, if you mix them up. Whereas in this one, it's not going to unify A with B, which is what it would have to do to make G of A make sense. Is there a way to say within your within Haskell's type system that these two ints over here that I want them to be the same ints over here within the type system? Um, what you would usually do is new type it. So yeah, you could kind of tag things, and that's pretty common practice. You know, so you'll have you know new type quantity is quantity int, and that means you can't accidentally add you know a quantity and a price per unit. So you create those outside of it, but then you use those in here, and then people calling it would have to tag them that way. Yeah, or? I mean, in general, you, you would try. I mean, you would try to avoid primitive obsession in the first place and not pass around ints or strings. You pass around, you know, a quantity or a name, and a name is sort of specific to your usage. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. Sorry, what's the on the next slide? Yeah. Being that A and B are both ints. And F and G both take ints. Yeah. Why is calling F with A and G with A? Why work? What's the problem? Well, this one, the problem is this one works, but the implementation is faulty. This one, the compiler will say, no, that doesn't match up. So the point here is that you're catching bugs earlier by making it more abstract, by using more parametric types. Uh, whereas this one, because you, it's more concrete, it doesn't know that you didn't mean to, that you meant to pass B there. There's no, there's no way it could. It, it sort of matches up spuriously. Right. Okay. Um, so I didn't really write an end for this, but I hope it was interesting. Uh, any questions? Yeah. So have you played it all around with Idris? It seems like if this is good, then dependent types are better. Look, Idris is awesome. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. Like, I really like Idris. I really like Park. I really like Agda. They're all awesome languages. At this point in time, I feel like oh, thank you. At this point in time, I feel like Haskell's got uh, the best power to weight ratio, the best libraries, all of these kinds of things. Um, and there is, I have noticed, there are quite a few people, maybe in the sort of like Dylan's um, sphere, kind of. They're, they're waiting for interest. You know, they're, they're waiting for the perfect language to come along. And it's like, well, you know, you're not going to get there in one step anyway. You're going to have to learn Haskell. And definitely once you get into dependent types in Haskell, which is something like the server web framework does, uh, it's starting to resemble a, a dog balancing a pee on its nose. You know, you don't, you're not amazed that he does it well, you're amazed that he does it all. And they really are making the Haskell system type system dangerous for things that are super simple and interesting. But then you've got to run the rest of the program in interest too.
Yeah. Hi, I'm sorry if this sounds like a completely new question, but is the fact is the reason why the compiler doesn't catch it in the more specific case because A and B are both both set to basically set to integers in that case. Yes. That's why it doesn't catch it. So yeah. It's just the specificity of it that you are being more specific that these have to be. Well, in, in this case, I'm, yeah, like, uh, it's it's just a type, it's a straight up type error in the top one. Wait, so in the top, so in the in the specification in the top, you'll, it is okay that A and B are both integers, but they just can't be the same one. Is that right? Mm, don't think so. Uh, you, yeah, oh, sorry, you can start anything you like in there, but even if you pass two into string functions in, it still wouldn't work because this thing has to type check by itself. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's right. Right. So that they can be the same at the calling site, but not at the definition site. Thanks. Right. Yeah, we have like a short break and then the last talk for tonight. Okay. There's more pizza, beer, beverages. Again, the restroom is in the gym and you know. Oh that. Well, I got the last one. I've never even looked at it.